things you probably didn't know about airplanes. How did I get this idea? Well, I watched the movie Top Gun Maverick. It's about a Navy pilot. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It was a good movie. I quite enjoyed it. The aerial stunts in that movie were ah, chef's kiss. So I said, hey, I'll Google plain facts, right? And this was one of the ones that popped up. This looks like it's going to be passenger planes, you know, commercial flights and such. But hey, planes nonetheless. This is not an ad for Top Gun Maverick because I'm not, I don't know those people, but it was an enjoyable movie. Uh, so yeah, let's get into it. Navy pilot and Top Gun Maverick. Regular commercial flight stuff on this list. <laughs> Let's get into it. Oh, and yeah, hey, subscribe if you're new or if you're old and just haven't subscribed. I appreciate it, and the likes and comments, all of that stuff actually really does help out. Helps push the video out to other people, so I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Okay, let's do it. Planes have changed a lot since the days of the Wright brothers or perhaps more accurately, Brazilian inventor Alberto Santos. Those first wood and cloth contraptions are an entirely different species than the sleek Boeing Dreamliners of today. With the continual advancements in aerospace technology, it's hard to keep up with all the amazing things planes today are capable of doing and withstanding. Below, 11 things you didn't know about airplanes and air travel. Well, let's see how many we actually didn't know. Okay. Number one. Airplanes are designed to withstand lightning strikes. I mean, that would make sense that they are since they are up in the clouds. Planes are designed to be struck by lightning and they are regularly hit. It's estimated lightning strikes each aircraft once a year, or once per one per every 1,000 hours of flight time. Yet, lightning hasn't brought down a plane since 1963, due to careful engineering that lets the electric charge of a lightning bolt run through the plane and out of it, typically without causing damage to the plane. Huh, have you ever been in a plane that was struck by lightning? And would you even know, or would it just feel like turbulence? I don't think I've ever been in a plane that's been struck by lightning. Do the pilots announce such a thing? Like, uh, this is your captain speaking. I would just like you to know that we have been struck by lightning. Um, everything is a okay I've turned the seatbelt sign on just for the moment. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your flight. I wonder. Maybe, maybe they do that. No clue. If you've been in this, if you've been in this, uh, if you've experienced that, please let me know. I'd love to know what happened. Alright, number two. There is no safest seat on the plane. I heard that the safest was like the back, but this is saying there is no safest. The FAA says there is no safest seat on the plane, though a time study of plane accidents found that the middle seats in the back of the plane had the lowest fatality rate in a crash. Their research revealed that during plane crashes, the seats in the back third of the aircraft had a 32% fatality rate compared with 39% in the middle third and 38% in the front third. However, there are so many variables at play that it's impossible to know where to sit to survive a crash. Oh, and plane crashes are incredibly rare. That is true. Plane is the safest way to travel. Right, that's still the case, isn't it? But, um, I feel like 
just purely based on numbers of this one study, the back is the safest place, so saying there is no safest seat <laughs> doesn't seem quite right. Because if I'm correct, 32 is less than 39 and 38. So, um, uh, your chance of survival is at least 6% higher <laughs> if you sit in the back. I mean, I guess they're saying that the difference is so low that it's negligible. Maybe, but I mean, technically, technically, isn't there a better chance in the back? What do I know? Alright, number three. Some airplanes have secret bedrooms for flight crew. On long-haul flights, cabin crew can work 16-hour days to help combat fatigue. Some planes, like the Boeing 777 and 787 Dreamliners, are outfitted with tiny bedrooms where the flight crew can get a little shut-eye. The bedrooms are typically accessed via a hidden staircase that leads up to a small, low-ceilinged room with a 6 to 8 pardon me, with a 6 to 10 beds, a bathroom, and sometimes in-flight entertainment. Okay, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. If you're flying transatlantic, flying to Australia, or something like that, then the flight crew's gonna need to sleep, not just the passengers that should be sleeping, right? Interesting, I've never seen one of these rooms before. I've heard that they exist. But I don't recall ever seeing one. Oh, there's a little phone right there, I guess, to communicate with those who are not upstairs sleeping. And it sounds like there's a plane flying outside right now. Oh, look at that timing, huh? Perfect. Can you all hear that? Oh, there it is. There it is. It's coming right over. I'm taking this out. This is perfect for the video, right? A loud droning noise. Perfect for my channel. Oh, let's take a listen. I'm gonna be quiet for a second. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. Alright, number four. The tires are designed not to pop on landing. What I would hope so. I would hope so. The tires on an airplane are designed to withstand incredible weight loads, 38 tons, and can hit the ground at 170 miles per hour, more than 500 times before ever needing to get a retread. Additionally, airplane tires are inflated to 200 psi, which is about six times the pressure used in a car tire. If an airplane does need new tires, ground crew simply jack up the plane like you would a car. And here are the tires. I mean, I feel like saying that plane tires are designed not to pop is something that does not need to be explained to people because, duh, planes take off and land so often that why would you design the tires to pop? Actually, are any tires designed to pop? Because now they have run flats, right? Where if you do get something inside the tire, It'll still drive for a bit. For cars, that is. Hey, maybe all plane tires are also run flats. I don't know. But, I mean, come on. Come on. Are designed not to pop. You don't, yeah, of course. <laughs> it seems obvious to me. There's a big plane right here. Okay. Number five. Why cabin crew dims? when a plane is landing. Oh, I read that in such a struggly way. Why cabin crew dims the light when a plane is landing? When a plane lands at night, cabin crews will dim the interior lights. Why? In the unlikely event that the plane landing goes badly and passengers need to evacuate, their eyes will already be adjusted to the darkness. As 
pilot Chris Cook explained to TNL, which is Travel and Leisure, imagine being in an unfamiliar bright room filled with obstacles when someone turns off the lights and asks you to exit quickly. I mean, that's true. Whether it's turning the light on very quickly, if you've been in the dark for a long time, or turning the lights off after you've been um, in the light for a long time and transitioning to darkness, your eyes need time to adjust, you know, so that makes sense. Similarly, flight attendants have passengers raise their window shades during landing so they can see outside in an emergency and assess if one side of the plane is better for an evacuation. Yeah, well, that makes sense to me. Processes very well in my um, motherboard, so nice. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, number six, planes are so huge. Well, some of them. You don't need both engines to fly. The idea of an engine giving out mid-flight sounds frightening, but every commercial airplane Airplane. <laughs> what? <laughs> but every commercial airplane, plane, 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 can safely fly with just one engine. Operating with half the engine power can make a plane less fuel efficient and may reduce its range, but planes are designed and tested for such situations. As popular mechanics reported, any plane scheduled on a long-distance route, especially those that fly over oceans or through uninhabited areas like the Arctic, must be certified by the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA, for extended range twin operations, ETOPS, ETOPS, which is basically how long you can fly with one engine. The Boeing Dreamliner is certified for ETOPS 330 which means it can fly for 330 minutes. That's five and a half hours with just one engine. In fact, most airplanes can fly for a surprisingly long distance with no engine at all, thanks to something called glide ratio. Due to careful aeronautical engineering, a Boeing 747 can glide for two miles for every 1,000 feet they are above the ground which is usually more than enough time to get everyone safely to the ground. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. The engine thing, yeah, makes sense. The gliding thing is even cooler to me because it makes sense because planes are designed to be in the air, right? So, just gliding to the ground, but that landing is probably going to be rough, right? That's pretty cool. I, I, I like, I think that's my favorite fact so far. Oh, look, a plane bathroom. All right, what's happening here? Number seven. Ah, smoke detectors. No ashtrays. Um, looking at smoking, but it says ashtrays. I'm confusing myself here. Okay, why there are ashtrays in the bathrooms? The FAA banned smoking on planes years ago. But eagle-eyed passengers know that airplane lavatories still have ashtrays in them. As Business Insider reported, the reason is that airlines and the people who designed planes figure that despite the no-smoking policy and myriad no-smoking signs prominently posted on the plane, at some point a smoker will decide to light up a cigarette on the plane. The hope is that if someone violates the smoking policy, they will do so in the relatively confined space of the bathroom and dispose of the cigarette butt in a safe place. The ashtray, not a trash can where it could theoretically cause a fire. If you do smoke in the bathroom, expect a massive fine. I mean, the ashtrays are there because of human nature. At some point, some human is going to say, you know what? I'm just going to do what I want. And in that case, the ashtrays are there. Please do not smoke on airplanes. Don't do it, alright? Massive fine coming your way. 
and do not put cigarettes in just regular trash cans. That's just silly. Don't do that anywhere. All right, number eight. What that tiny hole in the airplane window does. Oh, I do know about this one. This right here. It's to regulate the cabin pressure. Most airplane windows are made up of three panels of acrylic. The exterior window works as you would expect, keeping the elements out and maintaining cabin pressure. In the unlikely event that something happens to the exterior pane, the second pane acts as a fail-safe option. The tiny hole in the interior window is there to regulate air pressure, so the metal pane remains intact and uncompromised until it is called into duty. Yep, I did hear about the air pressure thing before. I mean, tiny hole, air pressure. Not really much else to say about that one, is there? Alright, moving on to number nine. Why airplane food tastes so bad? Airplane food has a bad reputation, but the food itself isn't entirely to blame. The real fault lies with the plane. A 2015 Cornell University study reported by Time found that the environment inside an airplane actually alters the way food and drink tastes. Sweet items tasted less sweet, while salty flavors were heightened. The dry recycled air inside the plane cabin doesn't help either as low humidity can further dull taste and smell making everything in a plane seem bland. According to a, 2000, a 2010 study from the Fraunhofer Institute for Building Physics in Germany, it's about 30% more difficult to detect sweet and salty tastes when you're up in the air. Next time you fly, skip the meal and maybe try a glass of tomato juice instead. Huh. Okay. Uh, people who eat a lot on planes, let me know if this one makes sense to you. <laughs> I got nothing. Alright. Number 10, number 10, number 10, number 10. About those oxygen masks. The safety instructions on most flights include how to use the oxygen masks that are deployed when the plane experiences a sudden loss in cabin pressure. However, one that thing that the flight attendants... What? I'm just going to go. One thing that the flight attendants don't tell you is that oxygen masks only have about 15 minutes worth of oxygen. That sounds like a frighteningly short amount of time, but in reality, that should be more than sufficient. Remember, oxygen masks drop when the airplane cabin loses pressure, which means the plane is also losing altitude. According to Gizmodo, a pilot will respond to that situation by donning an oxygen mask and moving the plane to an altitude below 10,000 feet. Or passengers can simply breathe normally, no extra oxygen required. The rapid descent usually takes way less than 15 minutes, meaning those oxygen masks have more than enough air to protect the passengers. Yeah, that's something that does not need to be mentioned right before you uh, reach peak altitude in a plane because people would panic. Oh my gosh, only 15 minutes worth of oxygen. How will we live? Flight attendants do not have time to explain. Well, you see, the 15 minutes is sufficient because we get to an altitude very quickly in which you can just breathe normally. People do not want to hear that. They're like, oh, only 15 minutes, I want to live. People's 15 minutes of fame last longer than the 15 minutes of oxygen. <sighs> Alright, number 11. And the last one for this video. Why planes leave trails in the sky? Those white lines that planes leave in the sky are simply trails of condensation. Oh, you mean it's not cocaine for angels. Hence their technical name of contrails. 
airplane engines release water vapor as part of the combustion process. When that hot water vapor is pumped out of the exhaust and hits the cooler air of the upper atmosphere, it creates those puffy white lines in the sky. It's basically the same reaction as when you see your breath when it's cold outside. You know, I was today years old when I learned that contrails is simply short for condensation trails. <laughs> I never once thought about that at all. I've heard of contrails and then, you know, conspiracies about them and things like that. But I never once thought, I wonder why they're called contrails. I just simply put it in storage somewhere in the motherboard and just moved on. I just never even considered it, but condensation trails, right? Is that what it, I mean, <laughs> hey, thank you, Melissa Locker. That's it. That's it. Did you learn something in this video? I mean, I did. Thank you so much for watching and for listening to this video. Um, I really appreciate it. Also, I have a Microsoft Flight Simulator. I downloaded it. Like, I got it when it came out, and I never played it. My plan was to make videos, just like calming flights over some scenery or something like that, and just have a chill, laid-back video, you know, where I talk about whatever. Maybe I'll pretend to be a pilot, but the thing is, I know nothing about being a pilot. And I've never played the game, like, not once, but maybe I'll struggle through it. Maybe it'll be fun. I think I'm still going to do a video, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, that's it. Again, thank you so much. I appreciate you all. And until next time, remember, be kind to yourself.